All aboard for the transcribed premiere production, The Cruise of the Paul Parrot, that thrilling story of the days of the whalers and adventure on the high seas. This is the story of Johnny Robbins and Sue Grange, a boy and girl who sail away on the good ship Paul Parrot on a whaling cruise that turned out to be a search for a diamond mine. With them are Captain Dalton, master of the ship, and old Dickon, the one-legged sailor who takes care of the ship's mascot, Paul Parrot himself. Ezra Grange, Sue's brother, who, as the owner of the ship, is the man who is responsible for the treasure hunt, and other members of the crew. As we pick up the thread of adventure, it is the year 1860. The Paul Parrot is heading homeward and has stopped for water and provisions at the lonely group of islands called Tristan da Cunha in the South Atlantic. Johnny, Sue, Dickon, Captain Dalton, Ezra Grange, and several of the crew have just come ashore on the beach of Tristan, the main island of the group, and are standing on the beach looking toward the tiny settlement. This is the most beautiful island I've ever seen. Oh, that gigantic mountain that rises out of the center. Why, that looks like snow on the top. I lad, and snow it is. It's a monster mountain for sure. Why, she's almost 8,000 feet high. Oh, those are the cutest little houses down there. I'm surprised anyone would live so far away from anything else in the world. Hi, lass, it's about the lonesomest settlement in the world, all right. Ships don't often call here, and after all, the whole island's only 20 square miles, and it's 1,500 miles away from the nearest settlement. Look, Captain, here come some of the inhabitants out to meet us. You're sure they're friendly? Oh, blow me down, Mr. Grange. Of course they're friendly. They're a mixed race, to be sure, but as kind of people as you could expect to meet. See, Captain, this must be the leader coming forward to meet us. Mm. Peculiar-looking old chap. And there's others behind him. And children, too. Gosh, just think. They never have to worry about going to school way out here in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> Let's me to where you're on, lad. You know, now, that's no way to be talking at eight. Why, the day will come when you'll be sorry as spokes so bleak and mean about school. Johnny don't like school. Johnny don't like school. Stow it, stow it, stow it, Paul Parrot, you blooming pelican. <laughs> well, here's the old fellow now. Ahoy, mate. Captain Dalton of the whaler Paul Parrot speaking out of New Bedford. We're putting in for water on a brief spell before sailing home. Ah, uh, welcome to Tristan de Cunha, sir. Welcome all of you. Uh, my name's Cotton, sir, governor of the island, sir, in the name of Great Britain, for who I served many years in the Royal Navy, on a man of war, sir. Mm. Uh, and this is my wife. Well, bless me, it's young one. You must come down to the house and let me fix a bite for the young ones and a meal for all you gentlemen. Of course, of course. You must all come with me and have a spot of cheer. Well, this is very kind of you, Mr. Cotton. By the way, Grange is my name, owner of the Paul Parrot. I hear from the captain here that your island is often visited by ships. Oh, well, to tell you the truth, sir, we've seen enough in the last ten years or so, sir. You see, Yankee whalers like yourself abound in these seas, knowing that whales pasture in these waters. Ah, oh, but this year, well, sir... I'm surprised to see you put in so boldly in these troublous times. Don't you know, sir, that the Confederate cruisers have been using these islands as, as a base to attack Yankee shipping? Confederate cruisers? Oh, vast man, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, you don't know, sir, that the United States of America has split in two parts over having, uh, not having slaves, sir? Strike me, mate. You can't mean our country's at war with itself. It's true. The South has split from the rest of the country and is calling itself an independent nation. The Confederacy it is. Oh. oh, Ezra, that's awful. How could Americans ever fight each other? Well, Sue, my dear, men sometimes do strange things when they're angry. We don't know much about this fighting, but if there's a war between the states, it looks like trouble for shipping. Ah, you're right there, sir. And the Confederates' gunboats are always down here and Tristan to capture Yankee whalers. So that's what you meant when you spoke of our boldness, Mr. Cotton. We saw no warships, though, near the islands. Ah, oh, you were fortunate indeed, sir. Uh, we'll be glad to have you as long as you may care to stay, sir. But it's only fair to warn you what might happen if a, if a cruiser sails into the passage and finds your vessel anchored out there. Captain, I think we'd better set sail from here as soon as we can. I've asked Mr. Grange. We've faced trouble before and we can do it again. But we'll not waste time. There's no use looking for squalls when they ain't around. We'll stow in some casks of water then, Mr. Cotton. Look over the ship for any repairs we need, and in a couple of days we'll hoist anchor. Yep. Avast. What was that? Captain Dalton! Captain Dalton! It's a full-rigged vessel sailing toward the island fighting cannon. And the Paul Parrot is out there right in its path. What if it's a warship? Easy there, me hearties. We'll hold two. It's flying no colors. All we can do is stand our ground and hope if she does attack our ship out there, our men on board will be ready for her. Rock! All hands ahoy! Dirty weather ahead! Rock! Rock! But I haven't 
of anything like that. Why, that boat is out there. I don't know what she's doing. Well, ten minutes have gone by and there's been no firing. What do you make of it, Dickon? Well, lash me to the skipper, sir. I don't know. I don't. But she dropped anchor out there. And it looks to me like the man in the bar of this boat that's coming ashore might be a skipper. Aye. Johnny, it can't be a warship. The captain's not dressed in naval uniform. But I wonder why it was firing that cannon then. Hey, Cotton, you white-bearded porpoise. What's the blooming idea of letting another vessel anchor out there in the bay just where I always put in with the Africana? Ah, uh, but, but please, sir, Captain Cross, sir. I, I didn't expect you back so soon, sir. I, I didn't think there'd be any harm. Ah, uh, stir it. You know, that's the most sheltered spot in the harbor where I always want to drop anchor. Well, there's there, Captain Kosh, whoever you may be. It's my ship you're referring to. And I'm so sorry I ran into your private slice of the harbor. However, as I saw no sign in the bay saying this space reserved for the Africana, I don't rightly see that you've got anything to say about it. Oh, a sea lawyer, are you? You better keep a civil tongue in your head. Of course, Mr. Kosh, I may be no sea lawyer, but I know enough to smell something amiss in the wind. When a merchant captain, for so I take you to be, fires cannons on entering a port as deserted as this. Now, suppose you state your business civilly to Mr. Cotton here, or you may regret your unusual methods. Rah! Tell him, Skipper! Lay on with the ropes, and Quiet, Rah! quiet, quiet, you blasted chicken face! Well, playing protector, eh? If it's any of your business, I'm Captain Kosh of the Four Master Africana out of New Orleans to Cape Town with cotton and trading goods. And we've stopped here for provisions. And if it's any further your business, any skipper who knows the seas knows enough to carry cannons for protection in troublous times like these. Are you satisfied, Mr. Sea Lawyer? Ah, your story sounds fair, but I'm not your judge. I'm Captain Dalton of the whaler Paul Parrot, homeward bound for New Bedford with a full cargo. A full cargo, Mr. Dalton? Aye. Your ship's riding high in the waters for one with a full cargo of whale oil, if I know anything about it. If asked, Mr. Kosh, you don't know anything about it, and there's no reason why you should. Well, let's end this argument and transact our business as we should. There are certain courtesies of the seas. Captain, there's them skippers what don't have enough sense to know the courtesies of the seas. Ah, blasted pirate! Blasted pirate! Ah! That's enough, Dickon. We didn't ask for your opinion. Oh, Dickon, you shouldn't have said that. There's no use getting the other captain angrier. Oh, I can't help it, lad, that I can't. I can tell a sea-going bully when I sights one, and he's one of them. You may lay to that. All right, we'll have done with it. I get first choice of all the provisions as usual, Mr. Cotton. Oh, oh but, sir, maybe Captain Dalton here... The uh, best, Mr. Kosh. I made port here first. But even then, I'm willing to give you equal choice. But first choice of provisions you'll not have. And why not? He knows I'll pay well for him when I reach... Cape Town and return? Well, why not pay now? Trade from your cargo. These folks can use cotton or other supplies better than your credit, which means less than nothing in this end of the world. Yeah, still interfering, eh? I suppose you can pay for all the provisions you want in cash. We certainly can, and more handsomely than you with all your bullying talk. Oh, you can, eh? It looks funny to me, Captain Dalton. A whaler that by the looks of a carries little whale oil, it is fixed to pay any price... Uh, maybe you picked up a pirate treasure chest, eh? <laughs> of course, uh, it ain't none of my business. Right, eh? right, it ain't none of your business. Rock! <laughs> <laughs> uh, looks like the blooming parrot knows you pretty well after all, Captain Carr. <laughs> uh, hang the blooming bird. Pretty well, I'll have to agree with you. But you're lucky to share a like with Captain Carr. Let's get the dealing over with. Aye, aye, for in the day we'll weigh an anchor ourselves. And then we're homeward bound. Well, Mr. Grange, looks like everything's shaping up fine now that we're leaving. There'll only be smooth sailing ahead. You may lay to that. Yes, Captain. I'm certainly happy that we're on the last part of our journey. And above all, we've seen no trace here at Tristan of what we feared most, a southern gunboat. Of us, Mr. Grange. You know how stories grow with the telling. I'll wager you we'll never see a warship all the way back to port. <laughs> Here we are at the ship. Come on, come on, you two youngsters. Up the ladder with you, Johnny and Sue. Come on, I'll give you a boost. Up you Hoist go. the whaleboat to the Davis, Mr. Pascara. Step lively, men. Stand by to weigh anchor. Right. Mr. Wainwright, send hands aloft to put on full sail. Thank you for wind to make the most of. Yeah. Avast, avast. Lash me to a yard on. Right. Captain Dalton, Captain Dalton. Look after a moment. That blinking swab cause has put it on old canvas on his ship. Well, blow me down, Dickon, what of it? 
We knew that the Africana expected to leave today, too. Aye, so we did that. But if you'll remember, Captain, he's bound for Cape Town, ain't he? Aye, so he is. And what of it, man? Well, sir, if he's bound for South Africa, and we're heading north for New Bedford, so help me, Captain, why is he tacking about and following us? What? Blow me down. He is swinging about. Oh, Dickon, you don't suppose he's going to give us any trouble? Well, Miss Sue, I, I can't say what's in the wind, lass. Oh... All I know is, when the skipper of a merchantman arms his vessel with heavy guns and goes about bullying poor settlers, and then he changes his course to follow a ship, he's more likely to be a blooming privateer than a merchant skipper he is. A privateer, is he? Well, blow me down, mates, with a seaworthy craft like the Pal Parrot. We'll show him our heels in short time. Ahoy! Hoist anchor! Ahoy! We're sailing! Wrong! He's a pirate! He's a bloody pirate! Why has Captain Karsh completely turned his ship around to follow the Paul Parrot? Those heavy cannons on the Africana do look suspicious. Is Karsh really a privateer? And what will he do if he catches the Paul Parrot? Will he find the priceless diamonds on board? Maybe our friends can outdistance him, but it'll be a thrilling race if they do. Whatever happens, we know it'll be exciting, so don't miss the next transcribed adventure in the cruise of the Paul Parrot. Until then, this is your Paul Parrot announcer, Dave Ward, saying goodbye. <laughs>